This is KGW News at Sunrise. Good morning, everyone, and happy weekend. Thank you very much for joining us on this Saturday, October 3rd. I'm Brenda Braxton. Let's take a live look outside this morning because it is socked in. That's our Wells Fargo Skycam. Can't even see the city. There's so much fog. Third morning in a row, we have woken up to this. Let's check in with Chris McGinnis for more on that weather forecast. Hey, Chris. Good morning, Brenda. We'll be waking up to this probably again tomorrow as well. Yes, as Brenda noted, it is foggy out there. Live look from our Rose City Sky camera. It's obviously still dark as well. We've got another hour and a half or so, hour at least, before sunrise. Let's go ahead and show you the weather story at least to start off this morning. Of course, fog is headline number one. Visibility right now, PDX, Aurora, McMinnville, down to a quarter mile. It's not very great a little farther up the I-5 corridor, getting up into the, uh, the Seattle area as well. We go a little farther south into the Willamette Valley, and then visibility improves a bit as you get down towards Salem, but then we're back down into a quarter mile in uh, Corvallis and Eugene. So we're going to be dealing with the fog this morning. That's one thing. The other issue is slightly reduced air quality out there. You note the yellow dots indicating moderate air quality here across parts of the metro area. And then as we get down into the Willamette Valley and parts of Marion, Lynn, and, uh, and Lane counties. And that will continue to be an issue here, we think, for at least the next couple of days. We have an air stagnation advisory in effect for the I-5 corridor through at least Monday. That's generally below 2,000 feet. The air is there's just not much to stir it up. And that's why we're stuck in this repetitive pattern of fog and low clouds in the morning and then hazy sunshine in the afternoon. But we will be dry and we will see some sun today. We're shooting for a high of about 77 or so later today. Uh, sunrise, as I mentioned, still a little over an hour away. Brenda, that happens at 712 this morning. Your full forecast comes up in a few minutes. All right, we'll talk more then. Thank you, Chris. New this morning, another round of arrests here in Portland after a protest. Four people were arrested after this gathering outside the sheriff's office in southeast Portland. Authorities say a woman jumped on a police motorcycle. She was captured and is being treated at the hospital before she is formally charged. Former White House counselor Kellyanne Conway is the latest to announce that she has tested positive for COVID-19. She tweeted last night that she has a light cough, she's feeling fine, and she started to quarantine. NBC News confirmed that Conway was part of the team that helped President Trump prepare for the debate. So in the meantime, the president does remain at Walter Reed Medical Center receiving treatment. He checked into the hospital yesterday afternoon. The White House doctor says the president is dealing with fatigue, but he's in good spirits. He's been given an antibody cocktail, an experimental drug meant to boost his body's immune response. The hospital stay has a lot of people asking, what does this mean for the presidential election? Well, right now, Democratic nominee Joe Biden says his campaign will drop all negative ads. Instead, he is sending his prayers to the president and first lady. This is not a matter of politics. It's a bracing reminder to all of us that we have to take this virus seriously. Melania Trump has also tested positive. Right now, she's in isolation inside the White House with some mild symptoms. A Washington couple says they attended a fundraiser with President Trump on Thursday, just hours before he announced he had coronavirus. Natalie Workman shared this photo on her Instagram page. This is at Trump National Golf Course in New Jersey. Workman says she and Brandon Dawson sat across from the president. As you can see, they are not wearing masks. Dawson's Facebook page says he lives in Camas. Now, to be clear, we don't know their condition. We have reached out to them, but we haven't heard back. As for the coronavirus situation locally, Oregon reported 314 new infections on Friday. That pushes the statewide total to more than 34,000. Washington County saw the most new cases at 66. The state also announced three more deaths. You can find COVID updates for your county and even your zip code. Check out the KGW News app or KGW.com. Two new counties are on the governor's watch list today. Cases have been rising in Benton and Clatsop counties. 
That watch list declaration gives them more state resources, but it also means they have to pause reopening plans for at least three weeks until their case rates drop below certain thresholds. Malheur is the only other county on the watch list right now. An outbreak at Pacific Seafood in Warrenton is part of the reason Clatsop County is seeing more infections. Health officials say they have traced the initial cases to a Labor Day community barbecue that was not associated with the company. So far, 87 staff members have tested positive, but the company says no one has been hospitalized and most people are not showing symptoms yet. The seafood plant shut down last week. It's now gradually reopening. The workers who tested positive remain in quarantine. In a virtual briefing last night, we found out those folks are getting help from the nonprofit Clatsop Community Action. In regards to the workers under quarantine from Pacific Seafood, we've partnered with several different local restaurants and agencies to provide wraparound services and supports. We have a team of staff that assess the workers' needs. They shop, order food, assemble, and then safely deliver the food to the workers. The group has delivered about a thousand warm meals to Pacific Seafood workers. In the meantime, the company says it's working with state and local agencies to exceed safety measures as it reopens. Well, Portland restaurants will be able to keep their outdoor spaces up and running at least through March. Peabot just extended its healthy business program. It gives restaurants the right to use the sidewalk or street spaces to spread out customers as they dine outside. The program was set to expire at the end of this month, and businesses worried they wouldn't make it through the winter. The owner of T.C. O'Leary's Pub on Northeast Alberta was really relieved to get this news yesterday. It's the reason why we're st we still have an open door. Um, we've been able to up our sales and bring our staff back, um, and now we know we can do it right through the winter, and we'll make this a wonderful winter wonderland. Many restaurants have put up tents and awnings over their outdoor tables. Peabot's extension allows for that with a few restrictions. Okay, let's talk about education for a second. We are about a month into distance learning for many of the state's school districts, and we've been checking in to see how it's going. This morning, Christine Pitawanich talks to teachers here in the Portland area about some of the challenges they're facing. Right now, I'm a fifth grade uh, bilingual teacher. You know, this is my 33rd year, and the first few weeks of school are always hard, so this is just hard in a different way. The problem with COVID is you don't know what the end date is. Teresa Figgins so, teaches in Oregon City. She loves seeing and talking with her students, even though it's online, but at times, it's tough. You aren't going to find a teacher who makes it through a week without crying or wanting to cry at least once, just because of the immense... Um, you know, everything takes longer and you can't you can't give the kids everything they need right in the moment. Figgins believes a lot of teachers are working many more hours and more than ever before. You know, I feel for my colleagues who have small children and are teaching. Using new platforms and addressing technology issues are some of the challenges. You know, when we do meetings and if something doesn't work, I say, you know, it didn't work. We'll try again. In a sense, we're all first year teachers because this is our first year online. I was perfectly honest. I said, I'm going to screw this up. You're going to screw this up. Let's just get through this. That's what this teacher of 27 years told students. Deborah Barnes is a broadcast journalism instructor in the North Clackamas School District. Normally, teens would have hands on learning in a broadcast studio or radio station setting. I feel like I am not giving them. Giving them what they deserve. And so that's very emotional for me because I left the business so the kids could learn about the business. The two teachers understand the COVID risks of in-person classes and support online learning. But as good teachers do, they worry about the kids. This is not coming out smoothly and I'm trying not to cry. Um, I have a family member who caught a, a rare disease as a child that has affected him his entire life. And we don't know. There's so much we don't know that I just, um, I worry. Yeah. I worry. Have some patience with the teachers, your teachers that are working with your kids. We want this to happen for them so badly, more than you know. 
Figgins says, here's a way for you to help your child's teacher. Tell them if something works well for your child, because chances are it'll probably work for another child. And if something doesn't work, tell them too. If they don't know, they can't help. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News. All good advice. Well, the pandemic certainly has changed life for all of us over the last six months. It's actually gotten a lot of people to pack up and move. The trends we're seeing all across the country.